themselves and some of them get their comeuppance afterwards, but some of them don't. So my very first story is going to be a story about a camel, Louis. It's going to be a story about a camel. And in the olden days, well, I mean, to be honest, so long ago that it was even before your grandmother's or her grandmother's time, it was that long ago. So a very, very long time ago, all the animals lived together in a beautiful forest and they all got on with each other very, very well. And they were all pretty nice folks and they liked talking to each other and they were generous to each other, except for one animal. And that animal was the camel. And the camel was so proud and so conceited and so full of himself that he just went around with his nose in the air, gazing at himself sometimes in pools of water in the forest and admiring his great beauty. Well, the camel thought he was the bee's knees because he had, quite apart from his lovely eyes, you've probably seen a camel's beautiful liquid black eyes, his long eyelashes, the camel also had amazing antlers. And these antlers had 12 prongs on each side and he carried them about with great pride. And the camel also had a long, luxuriant, beautiful, glossy tail. And the camel would go around the forest making fun of all the other animals, because to tell you the truth, he had more going for him than most of the others. And the animals, the two animals he particularly made fun of were the horse and the deer. And he called the deer Baldy. And he called the horse Spargy. And the reason he called the deer Baldy was because the deer didn't have any beautiful antlers like the camel had. And the reason he called the horse Spargy was because the horse at that time had a sort of thin little tail, a bit like a bone covered with fur, with a tiny little bit of fluff on the end of it. Well, whenever he saw these two animals, the camel would tease them and taunt them and say horrible things to them. Oh, here comes Baldy. Oh, here comes Spargy. And it made them very upset. Well, there came a day when they were absolutely sick of it, as anyone would be. And they got together one day, the horse, lovely horse and her friend, the deer. And the deer said, I've had enough. I've had enough of being treated like that by the camel. Who does he think he is strutting about the forest? He needs taking down a peg or two. And the horse said, you're absolutely right, she said. Absolutely right. I, I'm sick of it. After all, I've got plenty going for me. I just don't have the same sort of tail as the camel has. And the deer said, what are we going to do about it? And then the horse said, I have got a cunning plan. And she whispered her plan into the deer's furry ear. Well, the next day, the two animals went around the forest looking for the camel. And sure enough, they found the camel gazing at its beautiful reflection in a deep, dark pool in the forest. Ah, said the camel, gazing at its reflection. Mm, you are gorgeous. Oh, he said, looking up at the deer and the horse. You two, he said, uh, Baldy and Spargy, I see you're here again. What are you two up to? Where are you going? And so the horse and the deer looked very sad and they lowered their heads and they said, well, we would be going somewhere, but we can't. Oh, said the camel, where were you going? said the horse. Oh, we've been invited to a party by the lion himself and he's promised not to eat us. 
we've been invited to the party, but we can't go. How can we possibly go looking like this? How can I go with a tail like this? She said, you're quite right. I can't be seen about with this spargy tail. <sighs> and the deer said, yes, it's the same for me. If only I had some kind of crowning glory on my head. If only I had antlers like you, your beautiful antlers, and I, I could show my face, but I can't show my face at the party. Ah, oh, said the horse, well, if only there was somebody in the forest who had a generous heart, who was as beautiful on the inside as they are on the outside, who was always willing to do something for their fellow animals. If only there was an animal like that who could just lend us antlers and a tail just for one night only. Well, said the deer, as if the idea had only just occurred to him. There is someone, he said, our friend there, the camel. He's always been known as very generous and kind. Humph, said the camel, which was what he mostly said in these sorts of situations. What do you want? Well, said the horse, it's true. I don't know why I didn't think of it before. You are the most generous, kind hearted animal in the forest. If you would only see your way to lending me well, perhaps swapping my tail with yours so I can go to the party and I'd feel so grateful, so very <laughs> grateful. And the deer said, yes, if I could just borrow just for one night only your marvellous antlers, then I would feel so grateful to you and I would tell everyone what a lovely person you are. Well, not many of us can resist flattery of that type. And the camel was no exception. <sighs> he huffed about for a bit. <sighs> well, he said, uh, for one night only, just for one night now. Oh, yes, said the two. Oh, yes, just for one night only. <sighs> All right, said the camel. I will swap my tail with yours and I will lend you my antlers. Oh, good, they said, and quick as a flash, the horse swapped her tail with the camels and the deer took the antlers off the camel and they disappeared down a path in the forest. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. The camel looked after them a little bit anxiously, as you can imagine. But he said to himself, well, they're animals of their word and I really have been very kind to them. And he waited. He did hide himself because he didn't want anyone to see him without his beautiful antlers and his gorgeous tail. And he waited. In the morning, they didn't come back. Well, they've probably been delayed, thought the camel. And he waited a bit longer. Well, they still hadn't come back by the afternoon and the camel was getting a little bit restless. Looking around. In the end, he set off along the track where he had seen them disappearing to, looking for his antlers and his tail. He went a long, long way because, you've guessed it, those animals never came back. They never came back to give back the antlers. They never came back to give back the tail. And the camel, he kept on walking and he could no longer look in pools because he couldn't bear to see the reflection of such an ugly animal. And so he wandered out and found somewhere where there weren't any pools of water. That, where was that, do you think? The desert. The desert. Yes, it was the desert. And he went out into the desert and he wandered about in the desert. And then he kept looking. He kept looking at the horizon to see if they were coming over the horizon with his antlers and his tail, but they never did. And they haven't to this day. And that, my friends, is why the horse has such a beautiful, long, glossy tail. And the deer has lovely antlers that he sports, particularly in the winter. And the camel does not. And this is a picture of what the camel looks like as it's gazing over the horizon, looking, ever looking, with a tiny bit of hope in its heart to see if they'll be returned. And that is the end of that story. 
and I hope you enjoyed it. Do uh, just put a thumbs up if you did. Good. You've, thank you very much. So, Louis, I'm glad. Thank you. Thank you for the applause. All right. I'm going to play a little interval music here. That's so you know we're about to have another story. This story is about one of my favourite animals. This story is about coyote. Now, Louis and I were talking earlier on about what coyote is and who coyote is. Coyote, as Louis very cleverly said, is a kind of a wild dog. He doesn't live over here. He lives more where you live, Claire, doesn't he? Over there in the United States of America. And he wanders about the forests and he wanders about the woods. And he's been doing it since the beginning of the world. And this is a story from the very beginning of the world when coyote was wandering, or coyote as you might say, was wandering about the world and he's always hungry. He's always hungry and he's always looking for trouble. And he usually finds it. One day, it was a day very much like today. If you're in America or if you're in Europe, it was an autumn day, lots of leaves underfoot. It was a little bit crisp and cool in the air. The trees were getting bare and the birds were beginning to shiver. And Coyote smelled winter in the air and that made him even hungrier than usual. So Coyote was padding, he was padding. Actually, this is Coyote padding through the woods. Let me show you. That's Coyote. And he's padding through the woods and he's padding through the woods looking for trouble and all at once coyote stopped in his tracks because there was a space in the trees and what did he see in that space in the trees but a huge black tent oh, he'd never seen such a thing before so he crept very very quietly over those dead leaves he crept very very quietly and cautiously towards the black tent and making no sound he put his inquisitive nose through the flap of the black tent and then one eye and then his whiskers and then his whole head <gasps> and what did he see but the gods he saw all the gods and they were all in there in the black tent and they were talking among themselves and they were dancing and they were doing things and coyote crept in so quietly that you would have thought he was a mouse and not a coyote and he crept along the side of the tent so no one could see him and he watched and he saw that there was a young god there. He was trying to attract the attention of all the older gods. And the young god began to dance and he began to stamp on the ground. And as he stamped, he began to sing, stamp, stamp. And he got the attention of all the older gods and they began to watch him. And as soon as he had their attention, the youngest god stood there in the middle of them and he said, I have something that will make the night sky beautiful, but more importantly, useful. And then he reached into his bag, which was strung around his neck. And the youngest god, he pulled out a handful of crystals, sparkling crystals. And very carefully, he took one of the crystals and he placed it, he placed it up on the roof of the black tent where it stuck there and it began to beam and radiate light. And Black God said, see, I have created the North Star. This North Star will help the people of the earth find their way around. It is the most important star in the whole of the sky. And all the other gods applauded. Yes, well done, well done, they said. But he wasn't finished. He put more stars up in beautiful, intricate patterns. And he said about one of them, he said, this will help them navigate their way when they are far out to sea. It is very useful for sailors. 
put some more stars up and you said and these will help the people know when they should plow and when they should sow and when they should harvest all their goods and all the gods clapped him and they said well done very very good and then he kept on putting them up he kept on putting them up and then finally he said it is finished i have created a night sky that will be useful for the rest of time and all the gods gazed upwards ah oh, and they were going ah like when you see fireworks and you go ooh ah and they gazed up and coyote when he saw that they were all looking up at the sky he took his chance and he crept on his elbows and his paws and he slunk on his belly all the way towards the young god and the young god had put the bag of stars down on the ground and quick as a flash coyote snatched it he snatched it and he stood up and he put his paw into the bag and he pulled out a great handful of stars and he flung them up and he flung another handful up and he flung them randomly up into that black sky which was the roof of the tent until you could not see the patterns any longer and the gods noticed what he was doing but before they could catch him coyote had run out of that tent and he was laughing and he poked his head back in and he said ha ha he said i'm so clever i am coyote and i have made the sky beautiful before that he said it was only useful and what good is that now look at it it's beautiful and they all looked up and in fact, you can look up sometimes. I'm looking up now, but there's a lot of cloud. But if the cloud wasn't there, I would see a sky full of stars, full of stars. And you know what? Ever since that time, it's really, really hard to make out the constellations, isn't it? Really, really hard because there are so many other stars in the way. And that's because of Coyote and his mischief making. And that is how Coyote made the stars. End of that story. More oh, people are coming in. Put your thumbs up if you like that story. <laughs> Thank you. Great. All right, so the next story, would you like another story? Yeah, okay. The next story is, it's kind of about an animal, but it's also, it's also about a man. And it's about, thank you, Claire, it's good to see the response. It's about a king, not a very clever king, a king who kept making mistakes. And we shall see what happened to that king. Some of you may know this story, I hope you do. It's one of my absolute favorites. And it's about a king called King Midas. Now, some of you may have heard of King Midas and you may know that he had had a bit of an issue earlier on because he loved money too much. He really did, but it all went very wrong for him. And so this is after the time when he really loved money. And we've got to the time when he was over money completely. In fact, he'd gone a bit far the other way, to be honest. He'd stopped washing so much. He took to just going outside all the time. He didn't really take any notice of the affairs of the kingdom. He left it all to his wife. She wasn't very happy about that, but she was very good at it. So she stayed behind in the palace doing all the adding up and the spreadsheets and everything like that. And King Midas went outside into the woods, which was his favorite thing to do. He liked nothing better than to go into the woods on a summer evening, smell the air, listen to the birds singing and dream about his favorite God of all. I wonder if you know who that favorite God is. It was the God Pan. And the God Pan is the God of all the natural things, all the lovely woodlands. And he's, he's the God He's, he's funny th to look at. I don't know if you know what he looks at, but the god Pan has got the legs of a goat. Got the legs of a goat and his, his chest and his head are the head of a man. But he also has little horns on his head. So he's kind of half goat and half man, and he is all god. 
and he plays the flute. And he lives in the woodlands and all his life Midas had hoped that he would meet God Pan because it was his favourite god. So, one day King Midas was walking through the woods when he heard the most beautiful music. It was, it was like a babbling brook. It was, it was like the fresh leaves on the trees and it made him want to dance. And he looked round a tree and what do you think he saw? He saw God Pan himself sitting on a rock in the woods playing his flute with his goaty legs and his little horns and his curly black hair. And all the animals like the deer and the rabbits were coming up to him and laying their heads on his lap. Midas's jaw dropped open and he hid behind a tree still with his mouth open and he watched and he listened. And the god Pan was talking to himself. Oh, I'm so lucky, said the god Pan. I'm so lucky. I live the life, don't I? I don't have much responsibility. All the animals love me. I'm so popular. Oh, and I'm such a good musician. Everybody loves it when I play the flute. Everybody loves my music. I should really be the god of music, said the god Pan. Well, no sooner were those words out of his mouth when bang there was a crack of thunder and suddenly standing in the middle of the air was the god apollo now he was the god of music just so you know and the god apollo was glimmering golden and he was so bright like the sun that you couldn't really watch him or look at him directly so you were going like this trying to look at him through half closed eyes. And there he was standing in the middle of the air. Oh, really, said the god Apollo. You think you should be the god of music, do you? <laughs> very amusing, little brother, very amusing. Well, shall we see which one should be the god of music? I challenge you, said the god Apollo, to a competition. And then he clicked his fingers like that. And the mountain just behind him, the mountain uh, woke up and it opened one eye. You, said the god Apollo, you shall be our judge and say which one, myself or my little goatee brother here, which one is the better musician. And at that, an ear came out of the mountain. Yes, sir, said the mountain. Yes, sir. And sure enough, the mountain with a great rustling noise, two great ears came out of the side of the mountain. And then the mountain- Do you want to cut this, Simone, or you want me to do it? Uh, Claire, can you put yourself on mute? You can try it. Okay, so sure enough, these great ears came out of the side of the mountain. And the mountain took a pad of paper and a pencil and he said, ready, sir. And they decided that the god Pan should play first. And he did. Oh, and think of the best tune. Think of your favorite tune, the one you love the most. It was like all your favorite tunes bundled into one. That was how good and gorgeous the song was. And the god Pan played and the whole of nature started dancing. And Midas started dancing without even knowing what he was doing. Everybody felt so happy and Midas found himself with a big grin all over his face when the god Pan stopped playing. And everyone went, oh, and felt very happy. And then the god Apollo started playing. Well, it wasn't even like music when the god Apollo started playing. It was like it was as if the planets, it was as if all the planets were playing themselves. It was as if the stars had started singing. It was as if the 
The energy underneath the earth that brings the grass up had started singing and humming. It was as if every insect in the world was buzzing a tune that you didn't know before, but now you knew. It was as if the god Apollo, he wasn't playing his instrument, his lyre, his harp. He was playing you. And everybody stopped breathing. <gasps> Well, he played, and then he stopped, and there was a silence until it was broken by the mountain taking out his pencil and putting a big tick by the side of Apollo. It's you, sir, said the mountain. You are the winner of the competition. Well done, sir. And with that, he withdrew his ears and he turned back into a mountain. The silence after the mountain had disappeared was broken by the king, letting out a roar of outrage. Why, said Midas, no, why, this is all wrong. That's not music. What's the point of music if you can't dance to it, he said. And I can dance to God Pan's music. Nobody could dance to that modern stuff that Apollo was playing. <gasps> Everybody went quiet again and very slowly Apollo turned his golden self around and he fixed his eye on Midas. Really? said the god Apollo. You think Pan should have won? You think Pan should be the god of music, not moi? Well, the king was terrified, but he stood his ground. Yes, yes, I do, he said. So be it, said Apollo. You clearly have the ears of a donkey. And he clicked his finger. And when he clicked his finger, both he and God Pan vanished, leaving the woodland God free for a while. Well, <sighs> Midas let out a great sigh. And then his hand went up to his head. Ah, oh, you know what it's like when you've got a nasty itch on your head. And he began to scratch his head. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. What, what was happening? Something was happening to his ears. They were starting to grow. His ears began to grow. And as they began to grow, they became hard and they became furry. And they began to grow and they grew up, up and up until they were a foot about that far above his head. And then they stopped. And Midas, Midas felt his ears. He had grown donkey's ears. Midas let out a scream that echoed around the wood and he ran as fast as he can back to the palace. And he managed to get into the palace with nobody seeing him. And he ran into his room and he closed the door. <sighs> and then he looked around for something to wear to hide his ears. Oh, but he didn't have any hats and his crowns were no good. But then he spotted a long piece of a purple cloth. Oh, oh yes. And he began to wrap around his head. He began to wrap the purple cloth around his head until he had made it into an enormous turban. Oh, said Midas, because his ears were completely hidden. Well, a couple of weeks went by and the people, to be sure, they had been a bit surprised when they saw the big purple turban that the king was wearing, but they assumed it was the new fashion. And so some people began to wear big turbans themselves in various colours, some of them in the colour of yellow, some of them orange, one or two of them purple. And so the time went on, the two weeks passed, and then it became time for the king's regular haircut. Now, when you're a king, you don't have to go to the hairdresser. The hairdresser comes to you. And sure enough, the king's hairdresser showed up at the palace, turned up and knocked on Midas's door. Crept in and saw the king in this enormous turban. Uh, Your Majesty, we're going to need to take the turban off so that I can trim the royal hair, said the hairdresser. And the king began to unwind the turban. He began to unwind the turban and suddenly, boing, 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 the ass's ears sprang free and the hairdresser went, <gasps> he 
being too light to say too polite to say anything but you can imagine he did want to say a lot you shall never tell anybody what you have seen here today said the king you must bury this information it is a secret bury it and never speak of it or you will be severely punished well with trembling hands the hairdresser nodded and he took the scissors and he began to cut around the king's hair being very careful not to hurt the ears and finally with great relief he'd finished and he left and as he left the palace he had his hand clamped over his mouth because he knew that if he didn't he would be bound to blurt out the secret the terrible secret which was echoing in his mind the king's got donkey's ears the king the king's got donkey's ears. The king has got donkey's ears. <sighs> he couldn't tell his wife. He couldn't tell his friends. He would promised and he would be punished if he was found out. And then something else that the Midas has said came into his mind. Bury that information, he said. Bury it. It's a secret. And he thought, bury it. I'll bury it. And quickly he turned away from the city and he began to walk out into the countryside and he headed for a place far away where there was a beautiful lake. And there by the side of a lake, he began to dig with his hands in the soft earth and he dug a nice deep hole. And then very carefully, he knelt down next to the hole and he looked around to see that nobody else was there. And he bent his mouth close to the hole and he said, The king's got donkey's ears. The king's got donkey's ears. <sighs> oh. oh, he felt so much better. As any of us does if we've told a secret. And then he began to fill in, he began to fill in the hole and he went home with a spring in his step, no longer feeling the need to tell the secret. However, what he didn't know was that there were some seeds in that hole and the seeds, oh yes, the seeds began to sprout and they turned into reeds growing up, beautiful waving reeds that grew up by the side of that lake, waving in the breeze that came to visit. And as the breeze came to visit, it played with the reeds. And as it played with the reeds, very softly, the reeds whispered, the king has donkey's ears. The king has donkey's ears. And the breeze took it up and went on its way. And where do you think it went? It went into the city and it went down the streets and it went up the chimneys and it went into the windows and everywhere it went it whispered the king has donkey's ears the king has donkey's ears <laughs> the, the king the king has donkey's ears <laughs> and pretty soon everybody knew and the king had to live for the rest of his life being laughed at for his donkey's ears because he couldn't punish everybody, could he? And he never learned. Poor King Midas. He lived the rest of his life with his donkey's ears. And this is what he looked like. Well, there's a lesson in there somewhere, isn't there? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Lovely to see you all. All right, I'm just going to look and see what time it is uh, before I see. Oh, my good Lord. Have we got time for one more? Where's David? We've got time for. Louis, would you like to hear another one? Okay. Has everyone got time for one more? Okay. No, 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 no. All right. No, no. All right. I'm going to tell you. Oh, I'll just do my interval music first. Oh, 
yours for the final story. All right. This is one of my favorite stories and it's not about an animal. It's about a tree. It's one of my favorite trees and it is a tree called the baobab tree. Have you ever heard of the baobab tree? I'm going to show you a picture of the baobab tree. Woo! Can you see that? That is what the baobab tree looks like. Now, this is a wonderful story because it starts right at the beginning of time itself. When, right at the beginning of time, the creator was in a very creative mood and she was creating everything and she started with the trees. And then she was going to move on to the animals and the insects and things afterwards. And the very first tree she made was the baobab tree. And she, she took her little tree and she planted it in a nice fertile piece of earth. And she stood back and she said, there, she said, you are my first tree. And she said, you can be the tree of life if you play your cards right. And the baobab was so thrilled. It was so thrilled. It was the first tree. It was the only tree. Oh, what could be lovelier than that? And it was the favourite. Well, a couple of days later, the creator came with another tree. And it was a tree with beautiful red flowers on called the flame tree. And she planted that right next to the baobab. And this is what the flame tree looked like. The flame tree had so many beautiful red flowers on it that it looked as if it was all made of flowers. The flame tree was so graceful that it danced in the breeze, it danced in the wind. And the baobab looked at the flame tree, a little sour expression on its face. I haven't got any flowers. Why haven't I got any flowers? Maybe she prefers the flame tree to me. And it didn't say hello to the flame tree. It got worse. A couple of days later, she came with another tree, which she planted not far away. And it was the palm tree. And the palm tree, with its tall, slender trunk reaching up to the heavens and its beautiful fronds at the top. Oh, and you looked up at it. You couldn't help but look up at the palm tree. And it, it was there above everybody. And it looked down and it said, I can see for miles and miles and miles. Can you? And the baobab went, no, I can't see for miles and miles and miles. And it went into a right grump. And it said, it's not fair. Why, why can't I have a tall, slender trunk? And it looked down at its own trunk, which truth to say, wasn't slender and it wasn't thin. It was a, a little bit chunky. And then to cheer itself up, the baobab took a big sip of water from the pool, a big sip of water and another big sip of water. And the more water it drank, the larger and fatter it got. Here is what it saw, the beautiful palm trees reaching up to heaven. Could it get any worse? Yes, it could because a couple of days later, the creator came and she said, oh, oh, I love this one. I love it. I think it's my best work. And she planted near the baobab a fig tree. Oh, and as soon as the fig tree went into the ground, the scent of those figs and, and the shade given by the spreading, oh, the leaves were so beautiful and the whole tree had such a lovely shape. And you just knew that the fruits were going to be delicious. This is what the fig tree fruits looked like. And that was too much for the baobab. It's not fair. Why haven't I got fruits? I haven't got no fruits. I haven't got no slender trunk. I'm, I'm, look at me. It's not fair. She's given me all the worst. She's given me all the worst things and she's kept all her best work for these other trees. It's not fair. It's not fair. At that, the creator came by and heard the tantrum that was coming from the baobab. That, she said, is quite enough from you. I've had enough of your complaining. And she plucked, pulled up the baobab by the roots, and then she threw the baobab as far as she could away from the other trees, and it landed head first. It landed head first 
with its branches in the ground and its roots waving about in the sky. Well, the baobab could do nothing about it except go into a massive sulk. Now, how many of you just put up your hands if you ever go into a massive sulk? I don't believe there's, thank you very much. I do not believe there's nobody here. I do. So the baobab went into an epic sulk for a whole day, but nobody came. And then it went into an epic sulk. Thank you, Louis, you do too. It went into an epic sulk for a week, but still nobody came. And then it went into an epic sulk for a month and then a year and then more years went by. And finally, it had been sulking so long that it sank into a kind of a coma. It fell fast asleep and nothing could waken it. And hundreds of years went by. A thousand years went by. And that baobab would still be asleep now, were it not for one thing. A young elephant, a young elephant had been sent by her grandmother to go and fetch some water. And the first the baobab knew about it was a kind of, ooh, a tickling sensation in the side of its trunk. And it opened one eye, what, 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 what's going on? What's going on? Oh, I'm so sorry, said the elephant, who had been taught to be very polite and respectful to her elders. I'm so sorry, I've just come for a drink of water. I hope you don't mind. What, what are you talking about? What, what's going on? Said the bear, by wiping drool away from his mouth. The elephant said, well, it's just that it's, it's a drought at the moment and you've got all this lovely water inside you. Water? Water? Have I? And sure enough, the baobab felt a sort of sloshing around inside him. Oh, I have got water. Oh, that's quite good. Oh, it's quite, quite, quite good to have water. You, said the elephant, are very, very valuable to all of us because of the water you hold in your trunk. We love you. <laughs> love me. <laughs> Uh, 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 and it went red. It went red. It was so embarrassed. And the elephant said, and there's there's all your lovely fruit. Fruit? I've got fruit, said the baobab. Yes, yes, look up into your branches. And there, sure enough, there were baboons and they were sitting on the branches eating the fruit of the baobab. It's more like nuts than fruit, but they were obviously enjoying it. And, said the elephant, there are your flowers. Flowers, said the baobab. I've got flowers too. Oh, yes. Oh, the scent of your flowers fills the night, said the elephant. They only come out at night and they attract a certain kind of moth that will only come to your flowers. You are an ecosystem in yourself. Well, the baobab didn't really know what an ecosystem was, but it sounded good. It sounded very good. And the elephant said, we all love you. We love you. You're so popular. You are, said the elephant, the tree of life. Oh. The baobab, the baobab said very humbly, am I useful? Am I being useful to people? Oh yes, said the elephant, yes. And so the baobab and the elephant became friends and the elephant brought her whole herd so that they could tell the baobab everything that had happened in the last thousand years, which was a lot. And there they still are as far as I know, still exchanging stories still happy and the baobab is probably still alive because they do live for a very very long time and that is the end of my story about the baobab and in fact the end of all our stories for today i hope you enjoyed it hey hey don very yeah. very quickly because i had so much trouble tuning in today uh -huh. i caught bits and pieces until this last story i'm a griot or griot oh are and you so the baobab tree yes and so the baobab tree traditionally Griots have been known to sit under the tree to tell stories and to teach. And it is called the tree of life. I know. Its fruit is so nutritious. People sometimes live in the hollows of uh, baobab trees. And the every part of the baobab tree has a function that adds to the quality of life. Yes. So even though I was only able to catch this last story in its entirety, yay, Vazurizana, yay. very well done. Yay. Asante I'm, Sama, thank you very much. I'm you so are terrific. pleased. You are a dynamic teller. Oh, thank you. I'm Yay. so pleased because I love the baobab and, I, and I've and i fused together several stories with lots of natural history <laughs> about the tree because I'm so passionate about that lovely tree. So, yeah, oh, wonderful. It's a lovely tree to be passionate about. Yeah. Well, oh, thank so you. That, I, I love your stories. Thank you. It's amazing. Thank you, Louis. And Baba Z. 
Hey, Louie. Hey, Mr. Timmons. Oh, and Louie loving your stories is high praise. Oh, well, Because he will you. tell you how he feels. Oh, thank you very much, Louie. I do appreciate it. Love it. it. Thank you, baby. Anyway, my mom just warned you and asked me to ask you, we told you, we got a message on Facebook. You got a message on Facebook? Two messages. Oh. We said two from Baba C. Oh. oh yes, because my connection was very, very bad at first. Oh. I have been I have been attempting to come on board since 10 minutes of one. Well, oh. my time, 10 minutes of six, your time. Oh, how I know. annoying. Yeah, it's the tech. No imps have been after me today. Yesterday was Thanksgiving <laughs> here in America, and I told everyone I may miss it because I'll be recovering from the itis. And <sighs> anyone who doesn't know what the itis is, is when you eat a very large meal and all you want to do afterwards is sleep. So that is the itis. <laughs> this morning, you. for some oh, reason, God. I was up at oh, six. God. Oh, God. You know, so I guess the techno imps had the itis and they wouldn't let me tune in. But it's I'm me. so glad I heard your last story. Well, you thank just you. Made my day. Well, thank you, Baba C. It's so lovely to meet you. And um, my pleasure. Thank, and I want to thank you too, Dawn. And I apologize. Um, as Baba C said, it is the day after Thanksgiving and my grandchildren came to visit and things got very crazy all of a sudden. So, But I, I was able to listen to, especially the last story. Oh my goodness. But the images in the, um, the story of um, King Midas and his ass's ears. And uh, I just saw the reeds whispering, the king has donkey's uh, ears. <laughs> oh, thank you. Good. So lovely. No, and good. definitely a parable for our time. Indeed. Yes. When will we ever learn? <laughs> uh, all right. Well, that's lovely. Um, anybody else? Is that Donald there? I can't hear you. Sorry, Donald. Still can't hear you. Never mind. Well, oh, that's not very strange, isn't really. it? Hmm? So I know that, that, that Donald, if you give everyone a wave, you're, you're telling next Friday, aren't you? No, but I don't know that I be be do the mood we got a do do me the do well. Great. Yes. I mean, I mean that's great. So, so Donald's on next Friday. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, new computer. Oh. It's the technical difficulties earlier on. Uh, oh. Yeah, you kept coming and going. I, I thought, I'm, I'm not going to take this personally. <laughs> because the last time I told, I lost the signal as well. So next week, it's going to go like a well-oiled machine. Yes. Do you know what I do? You know what I do, Donald? I put it on cable. Just as I just, I don't even do the Wi-Fi. I put it all on cable, and um, mm, I just that's because sort of beyond my uh, abilities. Ah, <laughs> uh, one more. Yeah, go on, David. Uh, do the that oh god, la la eh. Is that are you talking about next Tuesday? Uh, young international uh, young international storytellers next Tuesday, I know uh, we have. The, oh God. Well, thank you, David. Thank you very much. And thank you for hosting. I know John is, um, John Rowe is off, no doubt, telling stories um, around the place now. So, um, uh, so David is very ably stepping into his shoes. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Anybody want to ask any questions or say anything before we sign off? Let's have another round of applause. Oh! Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it was a real, it was a real pleasure, and it was dynamic lovely. Dynamic dawn. Thank you. Well, I will uh, hopefully see you all again. Pleasure and mine. I'm going to be at the at the um, Marrakesh festival. I don't know if anybody's coming. 
I'm going to be at the festival telling my NART stories. Um, so <laughs> we'll see you all there, hopefully. Bye bye, Louis. Lovely to see you. Hopefully to see you again. Bye bye. Bye, Claire. Bye, Baba. Bye, Donald. Bye. bye. Thank you very much. Take bye. care, Clan. To be continued uh, until yes. the next time. Indeed. Yes, well, hopefully see you all next time. Bye bye, 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 Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Later, bye. nephew. Bye, <laughs> I've bye, claimed bye, you as my see. nephew, Louis. <laughs> Everyone take care. Bye. Bye. As always, thank you. Bye. My mum says Bye. yes, but but I I in peace to my mum saying I'm no, I'm not. Stop stop him, mum. <laughs> bye, bye. Oh. Hey David, good seeing you again. As always, Ali, thank you. Hopefully I can I can get in better next time. <laughs> I... Take care. Take care, my friend. Thank you, Louis. That's the way, Ali. <laughs> Thank you.